Hi guys, Olive here. Today I'm here to bring you a very exciting video, probably the most exciting video of the year, in which I'm planning to tell you about my top 10 fiction books that I read in 2016. In my last video, I did my top five nonfiction picks. I will link that for you down below in case you missed it. As you can tell, this year I decided to split my top reading list of the year into fiction and nonfiction sections just because that's what felt right. I've had kind of a mixed experience with my reading year this year. I read a lot of really great books. I read a lot of books I did not really care for, some of which really surprised me that I didn't care for them. I did not rate every single book on this top 10 list five stars. Some of these are four star reads, but in order to make it on my top reads of the year list, a book has to stick with me. It has to be sticky in my brain. It has to have challenged me, got me thinking, and I have to be thinking about it afterward in order for it to be a top book of the year. So one last disclaimer before I go ahead and start the list. These books were not necessarily published in 2016. These are simply the books that I read during 2016. Now that we've finished with the small talk, I will start off with number 10, which is A Cotta Witch by Nnedi Okorafor. Nnedi Okorafor is a pretty big name around booktube, especially in the SFF corners. This is the first book, and so far the only one published, of a middle grade slash YA fantasy series. This book is about an albino girl named Sunny. She finds out very early on in the book that she is what is called a leopard person, meaning that she has magical powers. Not only is this a really fun book with engaging characters and a really unique plot, but it is set in Nigeria, and a lot of aspects of Nigerian culture play a role in the book. Of course, I found that really refreshing, especially since a lot of fantasy series are rooted in Western culture. It was really a breath of fresh air. I am highly anticipating the second book in this series. It was originally supposed to come out this year. It has been postponed to next year, which of course is disappointing, but I will be eagerly awaiting it whenever it is released. Coming in at slot number nine is The Shadow of the Winds by Carlos Ruiz Zafon. A very brief plot summary of this book, if you've not heard of it. It, which is unlikely since it is a booktube darling, is that a young man, when he is a boy, starts to become entranced by this mysterious author. He tries to track down this author to find more of his works and try to discover more about his life story, only to discover that the whole back catalog of this author's works are systematically being destroyed. He starts to get wrapped up in the backstory of this author, Julian Carax, and this author's very much still alive relics from his past all around Barcelona, including a deranged police officer on this author's and then by extension our main character's tale who was harboring a long-standing personal grudge. The atmosphere of Spain is really what sold me on this book, but do not let that make you believe that the plot is anything but marvelous. It is funny, it is sorrowful, and it is so damn riveting. Number eight is a book you've heard me talk about a decent amount through the entirety of this year. That is Burial Rites by Hannah Kent. This is a heartbreaking work of fiction that is based off the real life last woman who was ever executed in Iceland. The main character of this book is, of course, sentenced to death for committing a heinous crime. She is assigned to live with a family in the area in the days preceding her execution date. This book is really best read in winter so you can feel the chill of Iceland in your bones. It's also particularly great on audiobook to create the atmosphere and help you know how to pronounce those Icelandic names. The depth with which Hannah Kent dives into the psyche of this woman who is facing an imminent death sentence is truly moving. As I've said before, this book was my first five-star read of 2016, and my fondness for it has only grown since I finished it in January. In spot number seven is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. This is an extremely atmospheric tale of a young girl who marries a much older man and moves with him to his estate called Manderley. Through her interactions with her husband, the people living in her neighborhood, and particularly the household staff, our narrator, who is never named, starts to feel that she's living in the shadow of her husband's first wife, Rebecca, who casts a very long shadow indeed. This was one of the most twisty, turny books I have ever read. Typically, when I read a book, if I am approaching the end especially, 
I am able to predict where the plot is going. You can kind of see how everything is arranged and how things are going to play out. Not the case with this book. I was shocked at every single twist, which is definitely impressive. I loved the writing, even though it is a classic, it is timelessly and beautifully written. And you can definitely tell after you read it why everyone loves this book so much. At number six is Euphoria by Lily King. This was also another one that I read toward the beginning of the year. So I have talked about this book quite a bit. This book is set in New Guinea in the 1930s. And it is based off of the famous anthropologist Margaret Mead's relationship with her first and second husbands, which kind of gives you an idea of where the plot is going. A very lonely anthropologist in New Guinea is studying the tribes and clings on to, becomes fascinated with a couple, a man and a woman, who start studying a different tribe in the same region as him. His fascination with them morphs into some more intense feelings as the book goes on. This is an example of a book that has really stayed with me. The writing is breathtaking. There are certain lines from this book that have just like been on repeat in my brain ever since I finished this. And that's how you know it deserves a spot in my top 10. Moving into the second half of the list, number five is Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. I buddy read this one with Leanne Rose at the end of the summer, and I have been thinking about this book, no joke, ever since. This was an intensely popular book, both here on BookTube and out in the bookish world in general a little while back. So you may have an idea of the plot of this book. The heart of this book is a devastating flu pandemic that very quickly sweeps the globe. We are particularly focusing on an interconnected cast of characters, which of course I love, the ways in which they are affected by this flu. You get flashbacks of their life shortly before the flu, what happened the day that the flu broke out, and you get to see through the eyes of the survivors what the world looks like after this pandemic wipes out a huge chunk of the global population. Not only was this beautifully written and very engaging, but it did raise a lot of questions in my mind of, what would our world look like if everything we knew changed in an instant? What would happen if civilization as we know it fell? How quickly would some of us be able to learn to live without the modern luxuries to which we are accustomed? I do find myself quite frequently in my everyday life thinking about the questions that this book raised in my mind. So to say the least, I loved it. And number four is Back to Moscow by Guillermo Arades. As you may have seen, I did a fairly infamous review of this one in which I summarized the plot of this book in between taking vodka shots. I'll link that down below in case you happen to miss that mayhem. This book is all about an expat doctoral student living in Moscow in the late 1990s, early 2000s, who is doing his thesis on the parallels between modern Russian women and the heroines of Russian literature. This is a very turbulent time for Moscow and for Russia as a whole, to which our main character, Martin, sometimes remains blissfully ignorant due to his singular focus of picking up women. Though I had my issues with this book, particularly with Martin's womanizing, the examination of Russian literature the inclusion of transliterated words, and the discussions between not only expats, but native Russians as well on what gives the Russians their Russianness brought this book together for me in a very special way. Sometimes a book just speaks to you. And this one did so for me. And in Russian, no less. My number three pick is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. As I've spoken about before in other videos, I can be a bit hipster aerial about things that everyone else loves. Therefore, I was a bit reluctant to believe that I was going to fall in love with this book, especially after having lukewarm feelings about Sense and Sensibility, but fall in love I did. I had managed to go through my whole life not only having never read this book, but not having an inkling of the plot besides everyone swooning over Mr. Darcy. When I read this book, I developed such a fondness for the characters I felt myself getting swept away by the plot. I've also watched the famous BBC miniseries twice since finishing this book in February. It is definitely my favorite Austen so far, but we will see if it remains so as I work my way through Jane Austen's catalog over the next few years. Getting to the cream of the crop here, coming in at number two is The Unchangeable Spots of Leopards by Christopher Jansma. 
I picked this book up over the summer and bumped it to the very tippy top of my TBR because the premise interested me so much. It gave me vibes of The Czar of Love and Techno, which not only is one of my favorite books, but was my favorite book of 2015. It is very difficult to summarize the plot of this book because it is incredibly mind-bending. But there are three main characters, two men who meet in college. They are both writers. They are both friends and rivals and are simultaneously good and bad for one another. And then there is the girl that got away figure who is one of the writer's friends and the other writers are narrator's love interest. These three are very close until they unfortunately have a falling out. Time, continents, and shifting perspectives have to pass until we see the gang get back together again. In this book, you will find an incredibly unreliable narrator, an unfathomable shift in narrative, and enrapturing writing that has stuck in my brain. How he achieved all of that in this short of a book, I will never know. And now we get to the most exciting moment in the video where I am very happy to tell you my number one pick of the year is The Ecliptic by Benjamin Wood. This book totally and completely took me by surprise this year. I had originally requested it on NetGalley. I had read a little bit and then put it down right before it got interesting, as I found out after I picked it up again. The book starts off at a majorly secluded artist's retreat on an island off of the coast of Turkey. Our main character is a painter who has gotten stuck on a major project. She has been at this retreat for quite a while now, trying to iron out the details of this project. So we see her in the present at this artist's retreat, struggling with her work dealing with her relationships with the other artists who have become her friends, and also dealing with a new arrival who is a very, very young, but very talented and very troubled young man who her group of artist friends is kind of assigned to look after. Then there is a chunk of this book that is a flashback to our main character's life as an artist living in the 60s in London, and then it goes somewhere else entirely. This is an intensely intelligent, surprising, challenging read with a crescendo of a conclusion that I know has been polarizing. I personally loved it. I felt as though the last quarter of this book was a what the hell just happened to me kind of moment. And I felt as though I metaphorically needed to catch my breath afterwards. It blew me away. So as I did say, it was kind of a mixed bag of the year. I did find some all-time favorites, but I did find a lot of my fiction reads to be lackluster. But given that this is the second top 10 list that I made, I feel like I do have a good sample of books that I really love that spoke to me. So I'm hoping to be making better decisions going into 2017. I would love to hear from you down in the comment section below if you've read any of these, what you thought of them, if you now want to read them. If you don't want to chat in the comments, you can find me a variety of places on social media and the links to all of those profiles are in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and since this is my last video of 2016, I will see you in my next video in 2017. Not a moment too soon. <laughs> Bye!